Nothing important happening in the first five minutes, so you're good. Five minutes in, however, I would be here. <laughs> it's gonna get, it's gonna be awesome. I hope. Well, that really depends on you guys, right? Depends on your questions. If you ask me some great questions, I'll give you some great answers. If the answer is not great, then your question probably wasn't that great. It was. It's not my fault. <laughs> I'm not taking any blame. Just as long as it's about real estate, I got you. This is my computer. Why don't they start doing a Facebook Live and he forgot we had a meetup. You good? All right, cool. This thing. Oh, do we got a... We got to wire the connection. Yeah, you know what? Wire it and then I'll just look at it like everyone else. It's so small group. Not a big deal. Yeah, oh, no, that's not it. No, the thing I got is when I took a picture, it's like a square. What happened to your foot? Oh. Stop, no, you stop and me. You gotta the I always pegged you as like domestic violence. <laughs> Definitely you were going to be the one. I wasn't thinking Charles. I was thinking you. The suplex. You yes, the suplex. It's the most dangerous people, the people that don't know the name of the techniques they use to injure people. <laughs> Watching you. Yeah. Um, does everybody mind moving to this side? Would that be okay? We've got a small group tonight, so I want to keep it really intimate. Uh, I got great questions. I mean, I have no questions. I have great answers. Like, at least we talked about this on this side. If they're not great, it's your fault. But thank you, because, um, yeah. They gave us a really big room, because I told them Tony Robbins was coming, but they didn't realize it wasn't the guy who actually, I was like, it's my friend Tony from Parkville, not the real guy, the tall dude. So they are like, yeah, let's give him the big room. They had fire walking things set up. It's like, wrong, wrong guy, man. That's what it feels like. I was like, our normal room is like a third of this size. But I, I guess they were giving me a VIP treatment. I know we don't, I mean, if I knew we had this, I would have like started a dance party. I got to like give me a ball or something. They just jumped out and like hooked us up. The clicker. Got it. favorite song do you guys know that I just got a rap made I'm not joking like that sounds like a joke but it really isn't I got a rap made by a guy on fiber this is when you know your ADD kicked in when you're like I told my girlfriend she's like what are you like going on like how did you end up getting a rap made I'm like the dude was willing to do it and he was pretty awesome so I now have a rap for the beginning of my podcast 
mean, it sounds, I mean, I even got it verified by people who weren't white, and they said it was pretty good, so <laughs> the guy was awesome, right? I mean, it, and he's like, you start getting on there, and you're like, I don't need a rat, but like, I'm going to have a rat, why not? But know that the point of that story was, there's no, burr, burr. I don't, how did I not get that in there? He wasn't allowing me, he was giving me no creative of this, by the way. He's like, no, nah, you're not, I'm going to do this, you got to just let me do it. I could just throw it at the end. You know what? It's my rap. How about that? I'll just send it to him and be like, you know what? It's mine now. I paid you. I can mess it all up if I want. <laughs> I can totally destroy it if I want to. All right, we're almost ready. Thank you guys for being patient. Did everybody meet each other in the room? Somewhat? Somewhat. Anybody wholesaling in the room? I know uh, Jay is. You wholesaling too? Anybody looking for houses? Anybody looking to buy a house? Oh, we got one fish in the room, too. All right, so you guys all should be talking to them, too. Because, uh, yeah, you know, that's what we got to do, right? We connect. He's looking for a house for sure. And I know Samir, is, she's really looking for a house. She's looking every day, so I know she's pretty serious about it. She's a serious buyer right now. Uh, she's looking to get her first rehab, but she's looking aggressively. She's not messing around. Like, she's been putting offers in and trying to make a deal. So, I mean, sometimes we're, we're hoping we could get a house, right, versus... Uh, you know, sometimes got to get her head wrapped around it. I, for me, when I was new, I took about six months, and I was hoping, and I, I was hoping no one would say yes, because I was like, I would be scared to death. But I didn't really know what I was doing, because I was like, I hope no one accepts these offers I'm putting in. Well, here's the good news. When you don't know what you're doing, it's not likely they're going to accept it unless it's really wrong. Hi, they'll accept it, but most of mine were really low, and they just weren't good enough. Eventually, I got it right, and then I, you know, I got a coach. He helped me out, and I started learning how to four plus floor equals eight. And, you know, I used to think it was like 15. It's like it wasn't that. So, anyhow, we'll jump in. I'm going to keep it really short, and then we're just going to jump into Q&A. So I hope you guys came prepared to ask some questions. Uh, really what I was envisioning with this was, you know, tonight I wanted to take time with you guys. I know most people in the room are either doing business or wanting to do their first deal. Uh, if you're doing business, talk to me about how you can grow your business. Uh, I've, I've been as much as doing 150 houses a year. I'm doing about 70 houses a year now, kind of in semi-retirement. It takes me about 20 hours a week. Um, so if you're doing 10 deals a, a year or 20 deals a year, I can easily give you really good advice on how to double, triple that if you want. Uh, if you're looking for your first deal, I can really help you because like getting your first deal, it takes like a lot of focus, right? It's hard. It's a journey. It's no fun. Uh, once you crack the code to doing that first deal, it gets a lot easier, right? It gets way easier. So uh, it's going to be an open Q&A with a master investor. I'm not sure when he's going to show up, but you got me until then. Uh, you know, and I'll do my best, and I might have to make, you know, go in bigger pockets and get you some answers. <laughs> we'll see. I don't trust those answers, by the way. Like, if this is being recorded, I love you, bigger pockets, but not all the advice on there is sound. Some of it is pretty sketchy. So, I'm Michael Green. If anybody didn't know that, it's my new cool picture. Delante got me. His woman took that for me, who is amazing. He's got Delante looking like, I don't even know, he looks like he's from some kind of, like, has anybody seen his profile pic? Oh my God, the women love it, right? Is it pretty hot? <laughs> like that, you can say it. I was just like, well, Dante is like a brother to me. Is it a pretty hot picture, though? I mean, it's pretty cool, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a very GQ, right? It's a great picture. So I was like, can you make me look GQ? Look, that's what I got. I got this cool pic, right? She hooked me up. I don't look that good. She gave me some other ones, too. If I was single, I'd be like putting them on Tinder. I'd be like getting all the clicks, be all the swipes if I was single, but I'm not. My girlfriend's like, she's seen those pics and she was like threatened. She's like, yeah, you know I have options now. I got these pics. Like, make sure you treat me right. So, I mean, I flipped about 1,100 houses over the last 10 years. And, you know, I don't say that to really like brag to anyone, but I tell that to people because if you don't know who I am, I really grew up in Brooklyn, Baltimore, uh, South Baltimore, the projects, by the way. My mom says, we didn't grow up in the projects. Yeah, I lived like eight feet from the projects and we were on welfare. So, yeah, we did have to pay our rent. That was the only difference between us and the projects. So we were actually more broke than the people in the projects because we didn't have the free money. But it was the same thing. And, you know, we basically didn't grow up rich. I only went to about 10th grade in school. Uh, eventually got in some trouble with the law, like everyone in my neighborhood did. I straightened my life up, got my GED. And around, like, 20 years old, I decided to really kind of be a productive member of society. And I was, always had an entrepreneurial spirit. So I went work for someone for a while and then started my own business. Uh, didn't make a lot of money at it for a long time because I just didn't know anything about business. Uh, about 30 years old, I got into house flipping, right? I always wanted to do it. Didn't think I could or didn't think, you know, I didn't think I was smart enough, didn't have any money. Because I don't know, I don't know those people who haven't done a deal, right? You think it takes a lot of money to do a deal, doesn't it? Well, here's what I found out quickly. When I got the knowledge, the money came. 
it's never my money, by the way, because I was broke when I got into this. It was other people's money, because a lot of people want to invest, right? They want to invest with you. Because there's a lot of people who are smart. Like if anybody's ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? They talk about being an investor, and that's what a lot of people want to be. They don't want to flip houses. They want to invest in you. And they, you know your stuff. They want to put their money with you, and they'll do it all day long. I've seen a lot of money come together with people right here at meetups like this and meetups like, other, like the Baltimore meetup, all these places, Charles' meetup. Uh, there's deals going down. There's people coming there with money who are like, I do not want to manage contractors. Please take my money. I'll take part of the deal. Uh, I'll give me a percentage. So money's not an issue once you know what you're doing, right? And I didn't know that. I just got really lucky, and I was like, I'm going to learn. He told me I could learn to do it with no money. And then come to find out, um, why well, I learned to wholesale with no money. You can do that with very little money. Uh, but then as I got really good and I did a couple wholesale deals, this guy with money seen me and said, hey, why don't we rehab a house together? I was like, well, I don't really know how. Eventually bugged me so much that he convinced me to do it. That's how I did my first house. And uh, now I'm about 900 houses later and about roughly three or 400 wholesale deals. And, uh, and he only did one house with me, by the way. And every time I see him, he's like, man, God damn, I wish I would have like, kept safe partners with you. Because <laughs> he's not doing that well. I mean, he's making a living, right? He's working, he hates it. He just didn't, he didn't work hard on our first deal, so he ended up not staying partners with him. He made me do all the work. And I don't mind, I like to work, but I, I like to be equal, right? Where partnerships have to be equal or, you know, they don't last very long. So I ended up getting another partner who was a hard worker. I mean, him ended up doing about 600 houses together. Um, this guy had a little money. My second partner had about $800,000, so he had a lot of money. It only took one rehab to attract someone $800,000. Now, a lot of people will be like, Mike, well, that's because you're white or because you look this way. I didn't look that way 10 years ago because I was broke and I was not really like exactly the best package. Okay, I didn't have any education. I didn't really like come off all that well. I've gotten more well-spoken over the years with spending a lot of money on coaches and you know, life experience. We get to experience more things when we have a little more money. Uh, so I'm a very different person than I was 10 years ago. And I explain that to people because I want you to know like wherever you feel like you are today, like I don't know anyone who can't do it. Now, usually people give up, and that's why they don't get where they want to go, right? We, we try a little bit. We dip our toe into the water. We're like, it's kind of cold. Ooh, I don't want to do that. It is. It's hard work, right? Flipping houses is not easy, but it's very possible. So that's the message I bring tonight, and I want to make sure you know that. So, you know, I don't say that to impress you, but if you're committed, you can get this done. And uh, a lot of years I was embarrassed of all the things I just told you guys. I freely tell it now because I realized that my coach told me, he's like, Mike, He's a very deep coach. I hired him about three years ago. Most, like, I don't think anyone even knew. Did you know that about me, by the way, when you first met me? I don't think I ever told you, right? Me and Charles have known each other for a long time. We did a radio show together about seven years ago. Um, he was obviously the talent, and I, I was just a dude who like, could come in and be like, this is how you flip a house, and I was like super boring, but he was actually entertaining. He, you were, no, you know you were. I was, like, I was not funny at all back then, but hanging out with him, you get funnier. He's a good, cool guy. And, uh, but yeah, he didn't know that about me. He worked with me for like six months and we were on like that show for a long time and because uh, no one knew it about me, right? My coach told me, he's like, man, if you told people where you came from, how you came up, he's like, yeah, I don't think people would judge you. I think they'd be like inspired by you. And I think they would want to, they would then probably inspire their self to know they can do the same thing. Like if you can do it, so can they. He's like, how many people do you think you could help if you were willing to share that? So I started telling people and it was actually kind of like, hey, you know what? No one cares. <laughs> no one cares. Everybody's like, cool, man. Some people are even like, me too. <laughs> like a decent amount of people. Funny enough, we all have our crap, right? We all have our stuff. My crap's way in the past. Um, you know, I really live a fulfilled life where I really give back. Uh, these things I do, I pay for these. It's free. I don't charge you because I want to give back to you. You guys come. I'm going to give you value. I want you to learn. I want you to grow. Um, you know, and if you want to spend some money on coaching, then maybe I won't go broke. That would be awesome, but you don't have to. You can come for free as much as you want. So, yeah, okay, I told you all that. All right, we'll jump up. Yeah, told you that. So this is a really big one. And this is what I've worked on for the last three years. My coach, and this coach is kind of like Yoda, by the way, if you envision. I don't, he's not very short, but he is much like Yoda. The guy gives me, drops some serious stuff on me. And I pay him a lot of money every month to do so. But I'm so glad I can afford to do this because my life was just really changed in the last three years. I went from being pretty successful in business that I feel like I'm pretty successful in life now. Right? And the business, can, we can do both. For many years, I thought I could only do one or the other. I thought like, I either had to be great at business, and if I was too charitable, then people would think I was weak or they would take my kindness for weakness, and it's just not true. You can be super charitable, you can help people, and still make money. That's leadership, right? And this is what he taught me. And this is what he said. He's like, what is stopping you from achieving your personal greatness? Uh, three years ago, I was flipping a lot of houses, but I had not reached my personal greatness. 
Uh, I got divorced at that time. Uh, you know, I was not happy. I didn't, I'm not going to tell you any crazy stories like I did any crazy stuff. But, you know, I was making a lot of money and I was doing a lot of deals. But I worked like 80, 90 hours a week and, you know, I couldn't even travel and unplug. Couldn't enjoy like going to the beach. I mean, at the beach reading real estate books. I was definitely obsessed. And I love this business. And I think a lot of you guys, if you're sitting here on a, you know, tonight on a Tuesday night, you're not home chilling, watching Netflix or doing fun stuff. Like I'm assuming you're pretty obsessed too, right? You're here. You know, that's what it takes to win. It is what it takes. However, I'm going to give you the lesson tonight and I'll share with you that there is a balance between the two and it's very possible. So when you're new, put all your energy in, do what you got to do. Quickly, as soon as you've gotten some money under your belt, you're doing some deals, figure out how to scale it down and get other people to help you and scale the business up that you can have that kind of lifestyle you want. My business now, I'm able to live on 10% of my income and I'm able to give back as much as I humanly want. Right? I'm able to get my family to work with me, awesome people like Rashad and Delante. You know, they came in, Delante was actually an intern, worked for free for a while, now I'm able to give him a job, make money. He's given a lot of opportunities, slipped his first house recently, Rashad, same thing. He now has acquisitions. So, I mean, I'm able to help other people in my family too. My uncle's my project manager, my mom outside, if you guys met her, that's my mom. She'll, you know, if you need money, she'll give it to you. She's like the most giving person ever. She's the reason I thought you couldn't be kind because like I feel like people took advantage of her. So I was like, I don't want to be like that. I don't want anybody taking my money. Like, because they will. Does anybody ever feel like that? Like, if you're too kind, people will be like, well, that's kind of my hood thing, right? It was true in the hood, by the way. People would take advantage of you if you didn't stand up for yourself. With that being said, um, really great leadership is learning to do both. It's learning to be, you know, a good leader, but also, you know, charitable and kind and, and have an empathy, right? So we can do all that stuff. So I want to talk a little bit about who wants to like, so first, if you haven't done a deal, let's talk a little bit about how you'll find your first deal, because I think that's a great conversation topic. And that's really what we're doing. We're really just going to have a conversation. We're going to talk. If you have a question, raise your hand. You'll have to use the mic because, uh, you know, Delante is going to have a mic or Rashad has it. And I'll just ask the question, who wants to get started, who hasn't done a deal? I'll get to the people who are doing deals next, though. Is that, okay? is that fair? Because you guys can wait, right? You guys are already doing deals. Like, you're kind of the cool people. <laughs> Good. We'll go, we'll go right to front to back, okay? So we'll start with you. What was your name, by the way? Leslie. Leslie, nice to meet you. Because no one has name tags tonight. We're <laughs> definitely on a budget, it feels like. So um, I'm a realtor, and okay. I'm looking to start investing in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as finding houses and opportunities, I wanted to know, like, if you're low on cash. <laughs> um, and Who's low on not, cash in the room? <laughs> All right. I am currently, I'm doing like 19 rehabs, so I'm currently probably the brokest guy in the room, just for the record. But yes, go ahead. And you're not one of those people who wants to, like, hunt down foreclosure, pre-foreclosure mm -hmm. and bankruptcy folks. Yeah. What's a good method to finding the deals? Okay. So, I mean, that's a big question. Uh, and I hear what you're saying. You're like, you don't want to take advantage of someone's bad situation. And not just take advantage. Some of them have had so many people call them mm -hmm. that they just hang up in your face anyway. True. But it's like, what's yeah. a better approach? I've never worked with pre-foreclosures or uh, like bankruptcies myself. Mm -hmm. And not for any other reason than there's a lot of other easier ways to go. Um, but it is a pretty tough place to be. And there's also a handful of laws in Maryland with pre-foreclosure that makes it a little bit risky and you could get in trouble for it. So in Maryland, I don't feel like it's worth the risk. And you're right, you're ending up with someone. I, I don't think the energy of people that are in pre-foreclosure is the kind of energy I want to be around. So I tend to focus on, uh, MLS is great, by the way, because you can get them post-foreclosure. Like once the bank actually owns it, and now, you know, this, the bank and them have already worked their dispute out, and now you can buy it from the bank at a discount. Um, but you need a system for that. And our system we use is we got to get through it. We go through, we weed all this stuff down to the most, the best deals, right? If there's 80 deals to look at, we got to know that, like, okay, these are the deals they're going to want to put our time into. And then we're going to go around, we're going to assess those, like figure out the numbers on the renovation, how much the ARV is, and then run it through a calculator. That I sold last month for 47 bucks, but put it through the calculator, it tells you what to offer, and you start making offers on the MLS. Now, when you're doing it on the MLS, it requires, like, consistency for you to win. You can't do it once a month, and you'll probably, you know, you'll get a deal like 2027. Probably quit before then, and that's the reason I joke about that. It'll take too long because it's a numbers game. So if you can get to where you're making one or two offers a week, just to start with, because I'm sure you work and you only have so many hours, uh, if you can get to that routine, it will start to compound over time. Then you follow up with the offers you've made one will start to shake loose. The MLS is a great starting place. The second place I would recommend if you can spend a little bit of money would be uh, driving for dollars and then sending a letter. 
Driving for dollars is probably one of the cheapest, best things you can do. You ride, you see a house that has high grass, there's tools you can use, there's an app called Driving for Dollars. I think it's like the best name ever, right? It's called Driving for Dollars, like 20 bucks a month. You go up to the house, put the address in, it skips traces and gives you a phone number, the owner's address, everything. You literally can hit a button, pay like a dollar and send them a letter. Cool app, right? I mean, for 20 bucks a month, it gives you unlimited re like skip tracing, which is pretty expensive. So, I mean, I've used it a few times. It works really well. I don't do much driving for dollars anymore, but a lot of my students do, and they're getting having great success with it because uh, it's super cheap. And uh, you can do that when you go to see an MLS deal, go and then maybe spend an hour riding around. If you're in a really good area where there are lots happening, you will see a lot of houses that have high grass. If it looks like it needs repair, that's what I consider a good house. That's a good prospect. Because that's what we're doing, we're prospecting, right? So for us as renovators or as wholesalers selling to renovators, we want houses that are in bad shape because that's all we can bring value to. If we look at houses that are in really good shape, then it's really going to be a hard kind of uphill battle because we're competing against homeowners then. So as soon as we go from a house that a homeowner cannot buy, that's the retail market, we get into the wholesale market. So when people are always like, why would people take a discount? In the wholesale market, that's just how we roll because people got to make a profit. Like there's no emotional buy here. This is all numbers now. Right? But as soon as that house is like grandmom and in really clean shape, well, okay, the person who wants to live in it could pay pretty close to retail for it and probably will. So it's going to be hard to beat them. Right? They have a different uh, exit strategy. They don't have an exit strategy. Actually. If there's an inner and stay, it's like a roach motel. They'll never leave. So they're not worried about making money. So the first thing is just make sure the house you're looking at is distressed. That's the key. Right? That's going to be a big thing. Doing the MLS, doing driving for dollars, a great place to start. Create a routine. So for me, what it's worked really well for me when I was new is if I did an hour every day, five days a week, much better than doing five hours on Saturday because if you do five hours on Saturday, then you forget a lot of what you've learned by next Saturday. But if every day you just spend a half hour to an hour and you're thinking about real estate, I promise you it'll stay on your brain. It's how you create the obsession to stick with it. So that was a long answer, but I hope that was helpful. That's a... Yes, it was. So motivated sellers are bank-owned properties and driving for dollars. Yes. Yep, the motivated sellers cost money, so I didn't recommend that to you yet just because it's a little more expensive to send mail. I tend to like to do that once you've gotten a deal and you can reinvest some of your money. The two free things is MLS and then driving for dollars. And they're, when I say free, they're very affordable. Like you're going to have to pay for gas, tolls, you're going to have to send a letter here and there, but it's going to give you maybe you spend 100, 200 bucks a month and it'd be worth your while. All right, thank you. Thank you. Great question, by the way. She like got right into the meat of it. Like, so what's up? How do I do a deal? Hi, my name is Shauna. Um, actually, yesterday I had a big burst of energy and I made quite a few offers okay. on MLS. Nice. Good Yay. job. My issue is, okay, I do have a coach who's long distance and another mm -hmm. time code. Uh, so I did get a contract to send to the realtors. You mm -hmm. know, these are the terms I want. I don't know how to fill that out completely or I don't know what a lot of the terminology means. Yeah. And so today, based on what I did yesterday, I have quite a few emails back from realtors. Mm -hmm. And so panicked a little bit today. So are they accepting your offers, all of them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great connection, by the way. <laughs> right. So they asked for the proof of funds, which I, I understand that. I got that. Mm -hmm. um, the contract that I sent them that I got from my coach, I'm not sure how to fill that out. Who's uh, writing the offer? You're writing it for yourself? Well, I, when I made the offer, I said, you know, if your client accepts my offer, I can send a contract. And so then my coach told me mm -hmm. to just send it and say, these are the terms I want for them okay. to do the contract and say, oh, got it. these Let are the terms the I want. Okay. And so yeah. a couple of them have still come back to me and said, I sent them a blank contract. I'm like, yeah, I meant to. Yes. But I still would like to know how to fill that contract out appropriate. Sure. So when you're working with a realtor, they really work best when they're working with a, one of their contracts. Because a lot of times if you're working with a bank, the bank won't accept that contract. They'll want, you'll have to use theirs. So with that being said, um, I think what you could do to simplify it for them instead of saying, here's the contract, like maybe just get a Word document and then list the terms out and say, hey, here's the terms I need. It would, okay. make it, it would simplify it. Because then that it's I clear. Understand. Yeah, just right. make it like, put in the English is what I, I had to have this conversation with my lawyer. He's like, no, no, this is how it's supposed to be written. I was like, can we write it in English? That's like an alien wrote it. Right. Like, I can't get a little old lady to sign this in good faith because she won't understand it. And I don't feel like I'm taking advantage of her. And, uh, and that's not good business. Mm -hmm. So, like, I had to go to, like, two attorneys to get them to write one in English. 
uh, and that's the key to the way I do it. Mine's one page, it's really simple, but there's training involved. So I'll talk with your coach, have him train you on how to do it, because that's the key to it. Like, you know, when we work together, I'm working with students, I'm like, there might be a couple hours of training on like every detail of it, because I do believe you should understand the terms in the contract. Yes, I right? agree. It, it empowers you to know what you're doing and being able to like make strong offers. Right now, I hold my calls, please. I'm actually in a meetup. I didn't tell them, don't they know? I don't know. No, you don't. The song was good. It would have been like, bah, bah. that's what it should have been. So um, for you, yes, hook up with a realtor. That might be good. But in general, if you're making an offer with the realtors, it's actually stronger than if you have a realtor putting the offer in. So going directly to the realtor does work better, in my opinion, because, uh, well, they have a little more of a, a vested interest than in you winning. Right. right? Because they get both true. ends of the deal, correct? Yeah, they get both ends of the deal. Yeah, I understood that. Yes. Well, that's just like financial, right? They, they make double the money or half the money. Well, They're that's really money's a lot awesome. of my issue. Yeah. One day I feel like I understand, I understand, uh -huh. and then I'll have these moments where I feel lost in the sauce. And so yeah. yesterday I had a good day, uh -huh. so today I'm panicking because I've got all these emails to answer. Well, you should do a testimonial for the meetup. Be like, I had a great day yesterday. I came to Mike's meetup today, <laughs> and I'm lost in the sauce. I don't know what's going on. And I don't think it's Mike Green's fault, but it could be. I'm just saying it could be. Now, so listen, I get it. Are you analytical at all, or would you consider yourself an analytical yeah, so person? I'm actually in the procurement field for the federal government. Got it. So okay. I'm kind of like embarrassed that I don't understand no. these real estate terms. No, I'm I mean, how come on? <laughs> you have, you're just new to the business, right? You've not been in here forever. Excuse me? Are you new to the business? I mean, yes, you're not. Yes. Yeah, so you, how would you know all these things, right? It takes time to learn them. If you're an analytical person, what I am too, by the way, so I'm going to give you some knowledge from my own personal behaviors. Uh, I overthink things. And I read books for nine years before I did my first deal. And the reason I ended up getting my first deal once I got a coach, because without the coach, I couldn't get any sense of clarity of like how to take action. I would just get completely overwhelmed with all this. And the coach was like, no, dude, right here. That's it. And I'd be like, no, wait, wait, wait. He'd be like, no, no, man, come on back here. Come on back here. And he helped me with that. I will give him credit. Because um, I'm just analytical and I want to read books. I would have probably read books for another 10 years. I was like 40 books in before I got my first deal. And I have no doubt I could have got 100 books in. Even today, I have to pull myself back. I, I will tend to research more than do, but I'm training myself to do more. And then understand that the research is more powerful if you go and do. Now we got to create ways to do without having risk. We can't go buy a property and lose 100,000 bucks, but we, we created a way we can do that's not going to be risky. And we get the experience and then we take notes along the way like a scientist. That's the way I, and that's been really helpful for me. That brings me to my other question, mm -hmm. the EMD. Okay. Okay, on these offers, I mean, I've seen, you know, people recommend just, you know, start ten, fifty dollars and let them go up. But the realtors and I'm like, yeah, they want a thousand dollars. I'm not giving anybody. I'm not throwing. If you're dealing with MLS, um, the facts are like a thousand dollars is even low. Okay. Uh, so fifty is unheard of. Uh, the bank's just gonna yeah. be like. One no. told me I might as well yeah. say zero. Not for the bank, by the way. Um, if you're working with a private seller or a personal seller, that sell, you know, right. anything's possible. But okay. a good realtor is going to recommend that it's one percent of the list price. Okay. So if you're like half of that, then you're pretty sketchy. And if you're like fifty bucks, you're like one percent of that. They're really not going to look at your offer very serious. Okay. So what I would recommend is get really strong with your numbers. Get really where you start to have a lot of confidence in your offer. So you're okay putting at least a thousand to two thousand dollar deposit. Uh, you could easily, to protect yourself, say, hey, I'm going to put a $2,000 deposit, but I want a seven-day like uh, inspection phase or something. Right. And that way you get seven days to, to call your rabbi, call your coach, whoever, and start saying, hey, did I do good? And if the answer is no, then you'd be like, hey, man, I don't like the inspection. You just move on. Because we need help, right? We need to be able to phone a friend. Mm -hmm. Like, Samira's in my mastermind. Like, you phone a friend quite often, right? She need, we all need help. I phone, I have a coach who's not even in real estate, and I talk to him about my deals every week. I just want him to look at him and say, Mike, am I missing anything? And often, funny enough, he's a super smart guy. He's an e-myth coach. He looks at stuff, and he don't even know like anything about real estate. And he'll give me some of the most intelligent feedback. Uh, and that's just so, so smart people can help. It's about us not being on our own island. As analytical people, we like to be in our own place. We don't like to always share and get a lot of different opinions. Uh, I've been a lot more powerful since I've opened myself up to have hearing other feedback, even if that person's not smarter than me. It's just a different view of it. So just keep working. I think that uh, you're probably expecting more than really true right now. Know that you're not going to know every answer and just keep moving forward. Uh, however, when you do get something accepted and it's time, make sure before you give them the deposit and make it real that you're pretty comfortable with it, okay, to the best of your ability. All right. Thank you. You're welcome.
Oh, right here, because, uh, yeah, you skipped him. Don't skip Al. No, dude, you got skipped, man. I, I didn't want to say anything, but it was no, true. I would never dare skip out. <laughs> so, so, Mike, so since we're kind of really talking about the money, uh -huh. so proof of funds, so would you, I know you said you didn't start that way. You partnered up with someone. So if I have a little cash in the self-directed or in a 401k or IRA, mm -hmm. would you suggest going that way? Again, as she talked about, EMD, and everybody wants to see, hey, proof of funds, show, show yeah. me the money. So EMD is pretty important if you're doing the MLS, but if you're doing private deals like driving for dollars, then like, I can't even tell you the last deposit I've given. I usually give like five, 10 bucks, and we're all good, man. It's a trust thing, they like us. We just give enough to ratify it. I don't think, okay, so working with a wholesaler, I don't think five or 10 dollars. No, no, it's not gonna work. So if you're working with the MLS or a wholesaler, not gonna work. Gotcha. But are you looking to buy the deal to renovate? Yes. yes. So you have some money to renovate. How are you coming up with the money to renovate? That's what I'm saying. Okay. Go direction of a self-directed 401k or in or partner. A partner or either? I mean, personally, yes. look, self-directed IRA is like a, you know, I don't want to go too crazy on it, but it's got a lot of restrictions and there's a lot of people who can tell you how awesome it is. But really, like I can run math models to show you that you could like 10 times your income if you took your self-directed IRA out, put it in an account, don't spend it and just grow it through real estate, but be able to make any investment you want with it, it's gonna grow 10 to 20 times faster. But the key to it is most people like love self-directed IRAs because it's money they don't end up spending. Like this is true for me too. If it's sitting in a bank account, all of a sudden I'm like walking by and see this boat and I'm like, oh my God, I have the money for it. It's in that bank account, it's an IRA, we don't wanna take it. So IRAs protect us against ourselves and if you think you're someone that needs protecting, then maybe leave it there. However, if you can manage and be disciplined with the money, then you can grow it a lot faster doing flips with it and keeping it in an account. I call that your bank, right? Creating a bank, right? It's totally worth it. I had somebody the other day say, I got about 250K and it's gonna cost me 85K to take it out. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, let's look what you can do with the 165,000. You can do about three flips at a time. In six months, you're gonna make about 90K pretty conservatively. So six months, you're gonna make all that penalty back. Now, you're gonna be able to, then I start showing the math, you're gonna be making like a 90% return on that money for the rest of your, however long you decide to keep flipping, which let's say it's 10 years, versus like 3% you're making right now, it's pretty game changing. We actually calculated one way he would have had uh, 250, he would have went to like 370. The other way it was like 16 million. So I'm not a hater of IRAs because they do they, they serve a purpose, but they're, the man created them, and I ain't the man. Like I thought the man's the guy that hires people, and they created to keep people around because like you're like I don't want to lose my IRA, or you know they're putting money in my IRA, and uh, it's really controlled, and it's really for someone who has a job. When you become an entrepreneurial person, IRAs they serve a purpose, but you know they if you don't have the cash to do a deal, it's gonna be way wiser to do a deal. With that being said, make sure you know what you're doing and you know that money doesn't get blown. That money's really important, it's your savings. So really give it a high level of respect if you're gonna invest it, okay? Cool, oh, who's next? Oh. So on that note, Coach, um, how do you feel about partnering with newbies and do you have a set criteria with yeah. your partners? Uh, so partner, we forgot about that. That's how I got in. I'll tell you my story is I got partners, right? So I got my stuff together first. I hired a coach for 15K. I paid him with credit cards. I did not, and like when I say I paid him with credit cards, he showed me how to take all my five credit cards that were maxed out and get them extended. And then I gave him like 4K of the 15K and he financed the other 11K. And uh, for about 400 bucks a month, I didn't even have the 400 bucks a month, but two months I did a deal for 16K. He knew what he was doing. He showed me the rope. I had never spent money on anything. I'm not an emotional person, right? As emotional people, we don't just give money away. It's very hard to get money from an analytical person. I'd never spent the dime on my education before this, but I was pretty at a, I'll say I was pretty right because I, for like eight months, was running around trying to get a deal and I couldn't get a deal. And this guy's like, and as soon as I heard him speak, I'm like, he knows everything I'm missing. Like what he's saying felt like it was connecting the dots. And he did, and he wasn't even close to the best coach. Charles's coach, by the way, we, we laugh about him. He's not even close to the best coach. But if you don't know anything, he was a freaking godsend because he was giving us the stuff that worked. The one thing he was, he was actually an investor and he was doing deals and he was showing us how he was doing deals. So like, if you're gonna talk and start like trying to figure all this out, money, get your stuff together, right? We had that $47 thing, like uh, I think he was just telling me, or no, actually Al was telling me, like he presented it to someone, it makes you look smart. 
And you don't have to be as smart as it makes you look. And when you're working with people and this person has no knowledge and you start talking some good stuff, the fact that you're a realtor actually is a high credibility thing. I know many people would be like, oh, you're a realtor? And you're like, yeah, I want to invest in property. Would you like to invest with me? They'll give you credibility just because you're a realtor. Now you throw some like documents on them and some actual like knowledge and you're really going to be have no problem. You just have to start asking, right? You have to come to these groups, meet with people, find out the person has money. It's usually the older person who has money. So anyone who's like probably over 40 or 50 is more likely to have money. Funny enough, my first partner was only like 28. But after that, my next partner was 60. Right, so, and he, me and him did a lot of deals together, you know, because he had more money than the first partner. He also didn't blow the money. The first partner blew the money. That was the problem. He ran out of money before we even got the flip done. So just start asking people. Put it on Facebook. Let the world know what you're trying to do. And I would, you're going to be surprised that someone's going to want to come work with you and do a deal with you. I, I love doing partnerships. So I think if you have no money to do a deal, doing a partnership is a blessing for both sides. Right? It's just amazing because like, you know, one person wants their money to make more. The other is just like, I want to get in the game and get some experience and a track record. It's a beautiful relationship. My only advice on it is don't marry that partner. Just, you know, be in an open relationship with them because you might want two partners or three, right? You might find that that partner can only do a deal or two and then maybe you need, my partner had like, he wanted an exclusive relationship. And one thing, if I, I would not have had that, I feel like I could have done things a little differently. It would have been nice. But, uh, you yeah, know, we have done a lot together, so no, no, I'm very happy that he put me in an exclusive relationship and kept me, uh, turned me into a man. You know, when you become a man, <laughs> so you got to work hard. <laughs> All that 40-hour stuff, you know, you ain't doing that no more. So does that mean, yes, you do partner with newbies? I don't personally partner with anyone. Let me tell you, and, I don't, and if I did, I would only partner with people and my students because they're trained in my system, so it's a lot easier to work with them. When it's working with like a completely new person for me, I, I spend all my time teaching and then it ends up being more time to do, have one person doing a deal with me than it is to do my other 13 deals. I got 19 deals going right now and I spend about four hours a week on it. When I work with a student, I might spend 10 hours a week doing one deal. So to be fair, I can't do that because it would actually take from my business and I have a lot of people who count on me. A lot of people are feeding their kids based on the fact that I make sure my rehabs go well. So what I, and, and I also believe that I should teach people to fish, not the not for me to give them fish. I don't want you to be relying on me. I want you to learn. So I don't partner with students. Now sometimes I'll partner here and there, but I try not to. I really want to empower people to do their own thing. It's not something you're going to hear from most coaches, by the way. Most coaches want you to partner. And it's not a bad thing. It's totally good because sometimes you get the hand holding. It's great. It's just not my thing because I do have to you know, keep a balance between my coaching and my real business. And uh, when I partnered with a few people, I found that my uh, project manager was a little butthurt that I was spending like 20 hours a week with my students, and then he couldn't get me on the phone to answer a question. So I was like, yeah, you're right. I'm kind of mismanaging my priorities a little bit. And, and then also I realized, you know what? I don't need, my students are capable. Like, they're capable. They just don't know it yet, but they're capable, right? They, they know how to do this. They just are, you know, they, they want me to help them because they think I'll make it easy. It's going to be just as hard with me as it would be by yourself, right? It, I can't really give any magic wands. Dealing with contractors is always going to be no fun. Right? There's going to be a lot of learning on the, in, the, in the trenches, right? we got to learn in the trenches. So never easy. Right? I wish I had an easy one for it, but I don't. Uh, I'd probably be pretty wealthy if I could do that for people. But good question anyhow. And, uh, and I'm sure there's other people in the room that probably would partner with you. So start talking with some people. So someone's there. Hey, who's next? Go ahead. Oh, you, need, you need the mic. No, I think I'm, I think I'm good. Well, so they can record. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that way they can hear. I know your voice is probably way stronger than Mike, though. But. So question for you, Mike, um, in regards to, I know we talked about this before, but the reaction time uh, based on, of course, the, the competitiveness mm -hmm. of finding an M MLS deal. Yeah. Um, you find an MLS deal, and you know, to set up the scenario, you find an MLS deal. I guess one of my main questions is, who are you contacting first? Are you... Are you working with a realtor or are you contacting the listing agent to then begin once after you've done your research to make your offer? Mm -hmm. And then what is the process? I guess what is the process after that until you, I guess, ultimately get to closing, which could take, you know, yeah. seven days, it could take 10 days, it could take 30 days, however you. So the main thing for you to know, if it's an MLS deal and it's priced really well, it's got about a one to three day shelf life. It's probably going to be under contract after that. 
So if you can't go out and see a house, first, if you're not looking daily, so you can't be five days later you found it, because it's probably going under contract way before you ever get your offer in. So you want to every day look at the MLS if you're going to do it. So when a deal comes up, you're first to know. Now, the next thing is, if the number looks really good and it looks like a house you'd want to do, you kind of need to stop what you're doing and get in your car and go to the house and, get it, and then start figuring some numbers out. Right? You have to have a process for you to walk through the house and know this is a 55K renovation. Uh, let me drive around the street, look at the comps, and it's, you know, I'm pretty confident with those. Run it through the deal analyzer and you know, the calculator and be like, this is the offer. When you're able to do that, then you can react quickly. You can get an offer in 24 to 48 hours. Uh, if you're like, I got to get my contractor through and get some estimates and some bids, well, while you're getting those bids, I'm stealing the deal like 50 other people or my students are stealing the deal, and then all of our competitors, the general public, are stealing the deals. Because that's just the way it is. Right? And then if you somehow get into five days and it's not sold, then the slow money comes in and the slow money pays too much. Right? The people putting offers in seven days later, well, they're motivated buyers. And motivated buyers always pay more. So we can't beat them. We can't pay 20K more for a deal. We wouldn't win. So we really have to get good at about one to three days. If you're doing private deals, you're going to have a different, you'll, you'll assess what their timeline is. They might want to do something today. Like we had someone we got on the phone with today. We're like, we'll talk to you tomorrow, make an offer because they're like, we want an answer now. It's a really good deal, so we're going to be like, yeah, we're going to talk to you tomorrow at 11, and we're going to sign a contract. And then there's some people, it's like, I'm just shopping around, give me a couple weeks. Well, then you got a lot of time with them, right? You kind of hold the offer back some. But the bank, if the number's good, which isn't that common, uh, it's going to sell quick. If the number's a little bit high, then you actually want to give it about 30 days. This, you know, if it doesn't sell, then the bank will be open to, you know, maybe considering your offer. So that's the process there. You know, that's the next process. You're like, uh, what was the rest of the question? Like, what do you do from there, essentially? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. I remember. It was like, what, like you basically the whole process. All right, well, you guys ain't going to know where to be, right? This is going to get long. I'll, I'll give you the summary because it would take like two hours to walk you through the whole process. And you can ask Samira. She's in my group. And how many times? We spent hours on it. And like, she's still probably confused because sometimes I confuse myself. It's a process. It takes a lot of time. But here's the reality of it. Um, I would personally try to put the offer in with the agent. You're going to have a much deeper advantage if you get in their inner circle. So it's the agent, it's their assistant, it's someone in their office, someone they like. That's their inner circle. Someone in their inner circle is way more likely to be able to get on the phone and get some details that might help you. It's that simple. Right? If you call an agent that you're working with and you ask them to put it in, you're outside the inner circle unless that agent knows them, which sometimes will be the case, and then you got an advantage. But if it's not, like it most of the time is, then you're really not in the inner circle. And when you're not in the inner circle, there's going to be these little things you don't get. Right? And when I get into the inner circle, I get a big advantage over people because they'll start dropping little clues. They might accidentally tell me something like, hey, you're close. I'm close. How close? All right. I mean, literally, I got a phone call the other about a month ago where it was like, hey, listen, um, 14 offers. I was 40K over list, and it was a great deal, 40K over list. And they're like, hey, you're not the highest offer. And I'm like, really? They're like, yeah, funny enough, uh, 13 offers, you 13 and 14, we're right at like 200 bucks of each other. And that guy's winning by 200. So I was like, if I offer another 1,000, can I get the deal done? Now, she was writing the offer for me. She said, I can't tell you that, but yeah, I would advise it. I'm like, okay, yeah, let's go up another 1,000. And she got the deal. And the numbers on the deal is I bought it for 111K. It needs, uh, I bought it for actually 107,500. 107, I'm putting 40K in it. It's worth 240. It's a great deal in Catonsville, a row home. It's easy. Like, that's a great deal. And every other offer, by the way, this is a lesson. Every other offer besides the guy who beat me was like under 100, like 20, 30K less than mine. Because it was only listed for 75, by the way. So everyone was trying to be greedy. You're like, I think we're going to make like 50K on this one. Like the market won't let you do that. You got to know, like if you're on the MLS, you aren't going to get 50 and 60K deals uh, on paper. You might get a situation on the back end where you get more than you thought. And maybe there's a competitive situation and you make more than you expected. But on the front end, it's hard to get really big deals on the MLS. But I know I'm totally good making like 30 to 35K. And if you are, then the MLS is a great place to get deals because there's money to be made there. And it's a big, you know, I did 17 deals last year for like well over 300K in income. So I'm totally in love with the MLS, but it's only 17 of the 70 that I did. But if you're new, what a great place to start. So do that. And the rest of it is just, you know, once if you can get them the right to offer, they're going to they're gonna guide you on what you need. They're going to tell you what to do. They're going to help you out. And, uh, and then you can ask little probing questions like, you know, how's my offer seem? You know, if, you were, if you were me, would you consider, you know, adjusting it? You know, 
it's hard for them not to answer you at some level. They don't want to tell you, but at some level they're going to be like, I don't know. I know you're good where you're at. They're going to start guiding you, right? They just drop clues. Say, so worst case scenario is they're going to drop a couple clues. Best case scenario, I've had them be like, well, let me tell us, just pull out the other contracts and let's walk through them. I'm like, literally, like, well, there's one at 107, there's one at 108. You know, look, if you could get it like 110, you're good. Like, literally, like, and he's got a contingency. I mean, I've had them just completely spill the beans, and I've had at least they always give me a little bit of information. All that, by the way, I can't get if I use an agent to write for me. So I'm an agent myself. I don't even write for myself because I'm all about the deal. I'm not about getting a commission. Commission is like very little in those deals. Anyhow, it's not a lot of money, a couple thousand bucks. I want to make the 35K. I don't want the couple thousand. So get into the inner circle. Do your best. You know, that's really like the best advice. There's a lot more to it, but it would take a really long time to walk you through that. You probably would have a hard time remembering because it's so much. So a lot of what you'll need is like a document that shows you like the systems and then practice and do it. You know, go out and make offers and practice it over time. All right? Okay, go ahead. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then if you're transparent and you ask what terms are important to your um, self, that's the key. Can you put that on the microphone? Because like you can't be giving good advice like that, no one knows. <laughs> like she's like ninja it, now no one's gonna have to hear it. No, that's great advice. You mind repeating it? Just ask the realtor directly what terms are important to them yep. or to the seller. And they'll tell you how to write the contract. Absolutely. She's, they know how to make the deal happen. That's why it's so important to get the realtors listing it or someone in their inner circle. Because they'll know those, the answer to that question. Because like, it may be the closing yeah. date, not the price. It could be, 100%. Yeah. Did you take some notes? He's acquisitions. He's like, I'm on you. Thank you. I got that. It was a great, that's a great piece of advice, by the way. Um, Cause you're right. I mean, they know how to help you. And they're usually like, if you're just pretty honest, like, hey, I'm pretty new, but I'm serious. I'm not going to waste your time. Uh, and, but I'm going to do a deal. And I've got all these things lined up. They're going to take you serious. They're going to want to work with you. Like people, agents in general, in my like experience are high eyes, which are people. They're very personal, high personalities. They love helping people. They, they're very, they, you know, they like to go to happy hours. They, they like to smile, talk. I mean, it's their job. I mean, if they didn't like people, it would be kind of a tough job to be in because you have to be with a lot of people and deal with a lot of personalities. I'm not saying every realtor is that way, but if uh, we get 100 realtors, about 85 to 90% of them are actually what's considered a, a, a outgoing person because the job kind of requires it <laughs> a little bit. It just does. It's why I'm not, a, you know, I, I do certain realtor stuff, but I, I run out of energy for happy hour because I'm analytical. I wear it down. I can, I can be sociable tonight, but look, you wouldn't see me doing it every night of the week. I can get a couple nights in. Then I got Netflix and chill by myself and lock the door and get some, you know, end up like binging on some stupid show I shouldn't be watching. Because I, I need some me time, right? But the, the realtors, they do that stuff seven days a week, 365 days a year. You're not, you're not a high eye. That's why you want to be an investor. She's like, I'm ready. Because see, like, she's like high eyes would never dream of being an investor really as much because they're like, you know, they love the interaction with people. As an investor, it is a little more of a lonely sport. It's one of the reasons I love like uh, getting to hang out with people I like now and getting to do this because I'm getting to connect with a community. For many years, I was doing a lot of deals and I was just like in my cave. I was like, I was like, yeah, it was kind of like I was a little Scrooge back there, like buying houses. And it's not fun at all. I'm just going to be honest. It's so much more fun sharing with everyone and giving you guys the secrets. And here's the great thing. I give the secrets every month, Tuesday at 6 o'clock. Uh, I'm on YouTube and Facebook all the time telling everybody everything. And guess what? It has not stopped me from getting a deal yet. And it's awesome, right? I, I would actually say I get more deals because of it. Because what happens is I share, people re share in return. Like you just gave me that great piece of advice. You remind me of something I did in the past. I kind of forgot that, by the way. So thank you for that. And that's like my value that I get in return. You know, it's the, so if nobody else has any value to give, I think we're gonna have to ask you to leave. <laughs> Sounds like a good nugget. I'm just joking around, you guys can stay. One day you'll have a great thing to say or do. <laughs> It'll be awesome. So who else has some questions? Um, who was next that I missed? Oh, go ahead, Marlo. Hey, Mike, uh, can you kind of just break down your first rehab deal, what you were looking for? Mm -hmm. You know, as far as maybe like the size of the house, what type of repairs? Yeah, and stuff like um, that. man, I'd hate to break my first one down for you because like I was fairly clueless on my first one. Because even though my coach was good at getting deals, he wasn't a good rehabber, right? So he didn't teach me that. I had to learn that on my own. But he was super good at marketing. And he was really good at negotiating and getting people under contract. That was his gift. That was his strength. From a rehab standpoint, he really didn't know anything. 
So, uh, you know, what I will tell you, however, and this is probably a better answer to your question instead of my first rehab deal, um, what I've seen as an overall whole on like 900 deals, I've actually evaluated my last three or 400 about a year ago, and there's common denominators in the ones that make money. And the ones that make money are first time home buyer houses. So price points, whatever neighborhood you're in, you wanna be in the, the price point where someone that's leaving their mom's basement or, an, or apartment, where would they move to? Most likely, not every time. So let's pretend it's like, uh, that's gonna be like a 175 to 300 ARV is a perfect price point. Doesn't mean you can't do a 135, like an Edmondson Village or something. I've done a bunch of those, they're pretty good. I prefer like a 175 though, if I could. Like if we get in a neighborhood like that, there's gonna be more buyers, a bigger buyer's pool. Edmondson Village has a smaller buyer's pool and that buyer's pool has a lot of grants. So those grants are a little tricky if you're a rehabber. We wanna have consistency and know we can settle in 30 to 40 days. With a grant, I've seen it take four months to settle. It can be pr pretty, uh, it's pretty erratic. And I don't want that for my rehab because that's a lot of my profits just dwindling away. And I don't want that. So my first deal, like if you're asking like, what should you be looking at for your first deal? My advice would be pick something that has a strong buyer's pool. Uh, I would love it to be like a three, two, right? A finished basement would be great. Uh, things like that are perfect. Uh, the reason I would stay away from a two one as a newbie is uh, I'm not saying you can't make monies with two ones, but they're a little trickier, right? You're gonna have to know the market and understand the adjustments, and it's a little harder to make that connection, right? I do plenty of two ones now, but it's because I'm like in a neighborhood like Herondale and Glen Burnie. I, there are a lot of two ones there, so I know the comps for two ones and what they sell for, and I'm pretty damn accurate with it. But I learned the hard way, and, and for your first rehab, you don't wanna learn the hard way. You wanna pick a winner something that you know they will get a consistent result. So for your first house, make sure you have a uh, first time home buyer is gonna be your likely buyer, and then make sure that there's plenty of really clear comps for it, right? Uh, Gerhard, who I was just on the phone with, if anyone came a little bit early, he got an offer, uh, he put an offer and he got it accepted on a farmhouse, and it's the only farmhouse. It's the farm, and then he built subdivisions around it, so there's just a farmhouse, there's one left. And he's like, I think it's worth 250. I'm like, well, show me the comps. He's like, no, no, I don't have any comps but the houses are 500 next to it. I'm like, well, there's no comps then. So how do you know what it really will sell for? You don't know until the market tells you. I mean, that's not a good, that's not safe. And when he really looked at it, I said, go farther out, go a thousand days back, find me a house that looks like yours and will tell me what it sold for. All he could find was 200K. So our, when we did that, we went and did that deeper research, we realized that, okay, it's probably likely 200K. He would have found that out after the fact, after he bought it and 50K difference, that's not good. So make sure you have comps, right, Marla? That's really big that you have comps. And that when you look at those comps, you're like, yeah, these are like my house, and they're clear. And then you're good, you're pretty safe. You know, don't do a million dollar house, don't go in the hood and do like a, you know, a house that has no buyers for it, like 50 or 60K, that's more rental play. Uh, you know, try to get something that has a little ARV to it, and things are clearly selling to homeowners. That's the best advice I can give to you on your first house. You'll, you'll be good then, just get it for the right price, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. So my question is, have you ever worked with a wholesaler? And if so, like what was your experience? The pros, the cons? Working, um, like for you looking, are you, you are a wholesaler, right? Or Yes. Okay, so I have to be careful what I say there. <laughs> no, I'm just messing. No, I mean, I'm usually pretty transparent, right? So working with wholesalers, um, there's a lot of them. Some don't know anything. They're hard to work with because they're gonna send you a bunch of stuff, eat a lot of your time. And then there's some that are super good at it and I can't ever strike a deal with them because they're masters of paying too much and selling for more. And that's their business model. And I'm down with that, right? If you can do it, do it. We make money any way we can. Perfect person's in the middle, right? They've learned just enough to be competent, but they still can have value from working with somebody like me because I can come make them an offer, I can perform, and I don't care what you make. Like Darshan, one of my students just recently sold me a deal and he like sent me the contract, said he was making 55K and I was like nothing more than high five. Like dude, you're making 55K, I was so happy for him. But I did tell him, I'll say, hey, but I don't recommend you keep using that contract. However, I'm happy, but I'm not thinking a lot of people are going to be happy when they see you're making 55K. They're going to nickel and dime you, man. They might come back later on and be like, oh, I didn't know this. I want 20K off. Or, so you don't want to like, let people know that. As a wholesaler, I love working with wholesalers. I've really never had a bad experience other than like when someone's too new or they're too savvy. And just, the bad experience with the savvy people is I can't get a deal done. They always like are selling it for 20K more than I should pay for it. They're finding the suckers to buy it. And I can't be a sucker, obviously, because I've, you know, I had to learn the numbers. And then the people that are like really new or just be like, I've seen this on Zillow, and like, you know, it's at full list. Like, can would you buy this from me? I'm like, do you have it under con? Oh, no, I just I want you to just buy it. I'm like, what? I'm so confused right now. And then like, I'll do that for like a week because I want to help them. And then next thing you know, like, we won't get nowhere. 
So like I, my experience when I want to work with a wholesaler, I just want to know they're getting deals from a, a valid source. And then other than that, like I think as a wholesaler, what you want to do if you want to become a better wholesaler, elevate yourself and get yourself very respected with the people who buy, it's obviously just be a person of your word, right? You tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. And if you can't keep your promise, then tell them that. Be like, hey, dude, I can't promise you this. I can't lock this deal up. I got other people looking at it. Whatever it is, just be straightforward. They're not always happy about it, but the one thing they'll never be able to say is that you were dishonest to them. You know, anytime a wholesaler's handled me like that, I might get a little butthurt for like 10 minutes, but dude, it's over in 10 minutes. I'm like, all right, man, I'll catch you on the next one. When they lie to me and they're like, hey, you're good, and I signed a contract, and then they're like, no, I sold to someone else. I'm like, oh, come on, man, you can't do that, man. I can't work with you now. That's bad blood. That's like, you know, that's some stuff that ain't fun. You make me feel bad. <laughs> you feel you ripped me off, and then now I'm like having talks with myself. I don't want you to do that. So, I mean, listen, as a wholesaler, just get your stuff together, do good, keep doing what's working, right? Build relationships. Uh, the best thing you can look for as a wholesaler is you can look for people, what I call unicorn buyers. Uh, that's going to be a, a husband that's a contractor or a wife that's a contractor, vice versa, and somebody's a realtor. The reason that's awesome, realtor don't have to pay no commission selling it, and the husband can get the work done cheaper. And then they're using all cash like an equity line or something. They're not really paying any real finance fees. In general, that person can spend about 20 k more on renovation and make the exact same amount of profit as I would make. That's a unicorn buyer. So you're not, you're not ripping them off. It's good for you, good for them. Right? They're still making 30K, 35K, but they, they're bringing value to the table is why they can pay 20K more. So you could buy it at a good price and it sell for 20K more and know that would be a good price for them. So finding ca real cash buyers, by the way. Like not everybody's a real, they just say the words. I say I'm a cash buyer, I'm not a cash buyer. I use hard money. However, I offset my hard money fees with being my own realtor and by getting my work done pretty cheap. So I'm still able to make pretty strong offers because of that. So is that a pretty good answer or are you yeah, more to it? Yeah, man. Thank Stay on the path. I wasn't going to say anything bad because now I know you're a wholesaler. Nothing, nothing around. I really haven't. Like, wholesalers are awesome. I buy about 10 deals a year from wholesalers. So, I mean, honestly, any, anyone who's getting me deals, like, you're my BFF. We're in. Like, fist bump it. Because, <laughs> like, you guys are a big part of my business, right? I mean, come on, man. You guys put a lot of work into it. I'm, I'm down with, like, I'm very thankful of the work that wholesalers do, man. How hard you guys work to get deals. I know because I do the same hard work. And some days I don't have to do it because you call me with a deal and I'm like, yeah, man, that just kind of, I might be able to go to the beach this weekend or something. He just hooked me up. That's what I'm looking for. So I always recommend, like, get to know wholesalers, get those deals coming to you. Because uh, if you're pretty serious about buying a deal, like, it might come from a wholesaler. You got something? I was saying, we have deals. Oh, you have some deals. Yeah, you do. Oh, you got deals to sell? Got deals that if anybody's looking. What kind of deals you got? Oh. You're being a little secretive about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know. They sounded a little like, they sounded very sketchy. I'm not going to lie. He's like, you got deals, man. Like, come talk to me back by the bathroom next to the <laughs> Twix. We got some good deals going on if anybody's interested. How do you know they're good? Because, I don't know, man. I've lost a lot of trust in you. I read the numbers. You got some rental <laughs> deals. We do got some rental deals. Like, if somebody's looking for a rental and, uh, we might have like the worst rehab you've ever seen at the cheapest price you've ever seen too. We're working on that tomorrow. We got a house that's like the stupidest low price I've ever seen, but it's about the worst condition I've ever seen too. So I might keep it and rehab it, but I'm trying to be thoughtful of my project manager because he's rehabbing a burnt down house. One of our rentals burnt down. And I was thinking if we give him a second burnt down house, he might like, yeah, there might be a revolution. So um, I'm being thoughtful of him. I might just wholesale it, even though I hate, I hate selling them off if I still need deals. But it is probably about maybe 80, 90K in work, but it's like burnt up. Thing is rough. But about the cheapest price you're ever going to see in this neighborhood, like big time, like really cheap. People are just like, take it, man. It's a mess. And I'm like, yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> Not going to disagree. So who else can I help? How about this? I got some questions in for you guys. How about neighborhoods? Like, who's, who's looking in what neighborhood and how do you guys pick? Let's start the discussion around that because neighborhoods are a big part of your success, by the way. All right? If you're in too good of a neighborhood, you're going to have a hard time getting deals. You're in too bad a neighborhood, you're going to have a hard time selling those deals, right? Go ahead, Delonte, you got something? Yeah, so um, I could just tell you from the first rehab I did, I did it in 21207, and I just picked that neighborhood because that's the neighborhood I grew up in. So I was familiar with the area. I kind of knew what it looked like, you know, as far as like, you know, safety and crime and stuff like that. It's a pretty good neighborhood, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, if you go a little bit off of Liberty Heights, that's where like the, you know, you're good at. But um, 
I used what I knew to find my first deal. So that could be something that you guys can try, you know, neighborhoods that you're familiar with and that you, you know, spend a lot of time in or you grow up in. That's always a good place to start. Yeah, that's good, man. I mean, so neighborhoods that are good to invest in are ones that are, have a lot going on, right? They're old enough that people want to sell. You, you, you make your money buying from the people who are like, I hate this neighborhood, it's so rough. And then there's these people who live in a neighborhood under it and they're like, man, I've always dreamed to move into that neighborhood. Then you come with this beautiful rehab and you sell to the people that want to come in and you, you buy from the people that want to leave. It's like 50-50. You go to Severna Park or Annapolis, it's like everyone wants in, hardly no one wants out. So it's not, the, and you want to have balance between that. The balance comes when the neighborhood is bad enough, right? There has to be like a random crackhead walking around. That generally is kind of my rule of thumb. Random crackheads help a little because like, you know, that's going to make the people like, you know, the little old guy that's been there forever. He's like, man, there's a crackhead walking by my house. I'm getting out of here. You want to buy it at a discount? 